Okay, so this is a Q&A, but we're starting off with a question on the Parsha. Navo, do you mind asking your question? Yeah, I have to remember it, but essentially you're I was You're either on mute, or you're not actually on mute, but I don't hear you. And I hear other people. Is there something on your end that's not plugged in? No, I don't. Oh, there we go. Now I hear you. Okay. Yeah. I have a button yeah. on my computer right next to the volume button that turns off the mic. So oh, it's there you go. Button. That's probably Whatever. It, yeah. Um, yeah, I was reading through the Pesukim, and there's a whole thing with hardening um, Paro's heart. Yeah. And I guess it is a classic question. I've just never heard an answer to it that I liked of how does God just kind of like take away his free will? And not like everybody's just okay with it, but I don't know. Yeah. How does that make so, me? Yeah. How did, so when, so when you say, that? yeah. So when you say, how does God do that? You mean like, why would God do that? Yes. Okay. Right. Okay. So uh, before I give you an answer, so as Nava said, that is a very, um, it's a classic question uh, and I'm not fluent in all the answers, but I'm going to show you a tool, which I, I know I've shown some of you before, um, but uh, in case you don't know about this tool, this is a very good thing to know about. So you go to Allah Torah, of course, and you go to uh, Tanakh and Iyunim, okay? Or, hold on a second, Tanakh, Iyunim, or if you're on the English site, then you go to Tanakh and Topics. Okay, hold on. So then you click on Parsha Topics, and then you go to the Parsha, Vaira, and here we have a bunch of topics to choose from, and here you have Hardened Hearts, okay, uh, or Divine Plans in Egyptian Free Choice, which is probably another one, but I, I looked at the Hardened Hearts one, and what you'll find is an English article that, um, hold on, let me make this bigger, okay, an English article that summarizes um, the questions and then the approaches, and actually, let me walk you through this. And we're not, we're not going to walk through this article together, but I just want to show this to you because I, uh, I'm going to give you the two answers that I'm most familiar with, but uh, in case you're interested in this question, uh, then this is a great, um, a great resource. So here, for example, it says like this. Um, we're just going to read the article here uh, for the first part. Actually, let's just focus on Paro, okay? Paro's heart and heart is not only the first and most famous case, but it stands out from all the others in that variations of the motif repeat a total of 20 different verses, including after each and every one of the plagues. Yet, despite the theme's prevalence and obvious significance, its meaning and purpose remain elusive. What exactly does the Torah mean when it says that Hashem hardened Paro's heart? By what means did he, Hashem, realize this goal? And what was the justification and objective of such a process? How, moreover, if Hashem had intentionally made Paro stubborn, why did he keep on sending Moshe to command Paro to let the people go? The multiplicity of verses in Paro's case raises a number of additional issues. So here are a couple of issues here. Uh, who hardened Paro's heart? While 10 different verses imply that Hashem hardened Paro's heart. Now, cool thing here. You click on the footnote. Oh, sorry. You click on sources. And it brings up all the psukim that are, that are relevant to the things that are being quoted here. Okay, so you could always have first-hand sources. If you want to go to the source and the Mikros Kodolos, you just click the Mikros Kodolos thing, and it'll take you to the you know, the ordinary um, uh, Alatora Mikros Kodolos. Uh, you could swap between Hebrew and English. Okay, so normal Alatora stuff. You know, you can uh, click on the um, verses in Tanakh, the periods of Chazal, the Rishonim and Gaonim, the Achronim. Okay, everything is there for your, your, uh, your convenience purposes. Anyway, who hard and powers hard? While 10 different verses imply that Hashem hardened Paro's heart, um, uh, from four others, it seems Paro hardened his own heart, and yet in six more, it was hard on its own. Who hardened Paro's heart? Hashem, Paro, both or neither. Second question, different verbs. The Torah uses three different verbs to describe the hardening of Paro's heart. Chazak in 12 verses, Kaved in six others, and Kashe in two more. Is this mere stylistic variation, or do these terms, three terms have different connotations? Whose hearts were hardened? The vast majority of the verses speak only of the hardening of Paro's heart. Shemos 9.34 mentions Paro and his servants, and Shemos 14.17 refers simply to Egypt as a whole. What is the relationship between the stubbornness of Paro, his servants, and all of Egypt? And then the last one, multiple objectives. Shemos 10.1 states that punishing Paro is the purpose of hardening his heart. But the very next verse describes a more public goal of the Israelites recognizing and recounting Hashem's might. In contrast, three other verses speak of the Egyptians acknowledging Hashem. What is the relationship between these disparate ends and how do any of them justify the means? Okay, so it, the first part in any Al Torah article will, will uh, outline the, um, the, the issues. And then the best part of the article is you go to approaches. And what you have here is you take, it takes all those questions and it categorizes them. Okay, so here you have suppressed free will, uh, and, 
idolaters cannot uh, cannot repent sincerely, and then didn't sorry impact didn't impact on free will, and uh, and you have the subdivisions within each one, and then what it does is it walks you through all of the questions that it raised before, and then you can click on the individual mafarshim within that parush, and it'll bring up the source on the right hand side. Okay, so it's really the perfect tool for Torah research, okay? So if you're interested in like a full comprehensive treatment of this topic, go to Al Torah and use uh, these resources and everything you need is right there, okay? Um, Sorry, but, where, does it start? where do you start looking on Al Torah? Where's the first place to look? So uh, the place where you go is the main Al Torah site and in the uh, you go under Tanakh and you click topics uh, or in uh, if it's in the Hebrew version, you go to Tanakh and Iyunim and then click on Parsha topics. And they're constantly adding to these, um, you know, to these topics, but, you know, they have for all, all, all the Parshios. And so it's just, you know, any Amazing. Parsha is, yeah, it's, it's incredible. Yeah, it's, it's really incredible. Um, and by the way, I encourage you, okay, I, I'm just going to, since we're, you know, talking about Allah Torah, I, I encourage you, I have encouraged people to do this all the time. Email Rabbi Hillel Novetsky if you have a wish list item, okay? Like, again, like I just asked him, you know, I've asked him for stuff and he'll just like make the site have it, you know? And like one of my Talmudim uh, got in contact with him this week and uh, and he'll ask the, the, you know, the student like, you know, is there anything you want? And I think what the student says, uh, it would be great to have something like this for, for machshava, for like Jewish philosophy. And so they start talking about like how to design it and like what it will be. So like, it just, he wants to make this into the best tool possible for like doing a Torah research uh, and, uh, and, and the most user-friendly possible. Okay, so here are the two approaches that I would like to go through. Um, I would like to go through the Rambam and the Sforno, okay? And I don't know if it's just my experience, but I feel like these are two of the most often quoted, but the reason why I'm going through them other than the fact that I'm most familiar is they are opposite approaches, okay? And if I had to summarize the opposite, the oppositeness of the approach is the Rambam holds that Hashem took away Paro's free will and Sporno holds that Hashem was giving Paro free will. Okay. Uh, and so uh, let's, the Ramam writes about this in two places. He writes about it in the eighth parak of Shemona Prakim and in the sixth parak of the Mishnah Torah. But because I didn't initially plan this as a shear, um, and again, this is not a shear, right? This is just Q&A, just extended Q&A that's being recorded. Um, <laughs> um, then uh, I thought maybe we'll start with the, the Shemota Prakim because we have an English version and I could read it in English and that'll give us an overview. And then if we want to, we can go into the Mishnah Torah version of it, okay? So this is in Shemota Prakim and I'm using the, uh, let me get it to show you, hold on. Uh, the best edition, not just the best translation, the, but the best edition of the Ramam Shemona Prakim that I know of is this one uh, by Rabbi Yaakov Feldman. The reason why it's the best is because it has the Kafich Arabic to Hebrew translation. It has a good English translation, and it has good footnotes and good endnotes. Okay. Uh, if you ever want to learn Shemona Prakim, then this is the one to, to, to do. It's published by, who is it published by? Uh, Targum Press. Okay. Um, so we're using this translation. Okay, so he says like this. So this is after the Ramam goes into free will about what free will is. So he says, but there is something else to explain on this subject. For there are several verses that lead people to imagine that God preordains and compels disobedience, which is absurd. So we will explain them since people discuss them so much. Now, the first question is not related to what Nava is asking, but it's in the Parsha. And I feel like uh, since the Ramam makes this question comes first, come first, uh, I think it would be in our interest to read it. It's not that long. Okay, an example would be God's statement to Abraham, they will serve them, the Egyptians, meaning the Jews will serve the Egyptians, and they, the Egyptians, will afflict them, i.e. your descendants. Okay, so how does that seem to go against free will? Because it sounds like it's saying that this is going to happen, that the Egyptians will enslave the, uh, the Jews. Based on that, some say, apparently, God decreed that the Egyptians were to harm the Abraham's descendants. Why then did he, did Hashem punish them? Weren't they forced to enslave them as it was decreed? Right, so classic question, right? Did did the the Egyptian slavery have to happen? Okay, so the Ramam's answer is something that I, I remember the first couple of times I've read it, it feels slippery, okay? And then the Ramam explains himself get, with a better muscle, and then it feels like slippery, but you have traction on your shoes, okay? So in other words, like, like this takes some thinking, okay? He says, but the answer is as follows. It is as if God had said, some people yet to be born will be rebellious, others obedient, 
some righteous and others wrongdoers. That is simply a fact. God's saying that does not compel any one person to necessarily be a wrongdoer or has any or anyone else to necessarily be righteous. Rather, whoever happens to be a wrongdoer has chosen to be one. And if he wants to be righteous, he could have chosen to do so without anything preventing him. Likewise, any righteous person could have been a wrongdoer if he had wanted to without anything preventing him. God's declaration was not directed towards anyone in particular who might then claim it was decreed upon him to do wrong. Rather, he spoke in general terms and every individual is free to make his own decision in accordance with his nature. Likewise, each and every Egyptian who harmed and oppressed the Israelites would have chosen, could have chosen not to harm them if he so wanted. It was not decreed on any individual to do harm. So just use a contemporary example. If you have a high school teacher in uh, an advanced, like a very difficult AP class, and he says at the beginning of the, uh, the semester, some of you will, uh, will ace the class, some of you will uh, get mediocre grades, and some of you will get bad grades. So if a student got a bad grade, the student could not go to the professor and say, you forced me to get the bad grade because you said some certain, certain students will get those bad grades. No, no, no. Obviously, the teacher was just saying, yeah, there's a bell curve. You know, it's going to happen. So too, there will be Egyptians who will enslave the Jews. And there will be righteous people and there will be wicked people. But God is not saying to an individual, you will be destined to, to, to serve this person. And now the Ram gives a better example, in my opinion, uh, from the Torah itself. The same response applies to God's statement to Moshe. Behold, oh, sorry, not yet. This is also good, but not the best. Behold, you are about to lie with your forefathers and the people will rise up and stray after the alien gods of the land. This is in uh, the end of Devarim. It is tantamount to God saying, do, do such and such to whoever serves idols. For if no one had served idols, then there would have been no reason for all the threats and the curses. Okay, uh, and he elaborates. In fact, the same is true of all the punishments in the Torah. After all, we would not say that because there is a sentence of stoning in the Torah, someone who profaned the Sabbath was compelled to do so, any more than we would say that because there are curses in the Torah against one who worships idols, anyone who wor worshiped idols and thus subjected himself to these curses was preordained to worship idols. Rather, whoever worshiped idols did so of his own volition and subjected himself to punishment. As it is written, since they chose their own ways and delight in their abominations, I will choose their affliction and bring their fears upon them. So in other words, if you just say, you know, the fact that the Torah says one who violates Shabbos will get the, uh, the death penalty by stoning. That doesn't mean that there has to be someone who is going to get the death penalty. And it certainly doesn't mean that if you do a malach on Shabbos, then you can blame it on God, right? It just means that this is something that is, is, is going to happen just statistically, you know, and in fact, if it didn't happen, then that wouldn't be a problem either, right? If, if no one ended up violating Shabbos, in fact, we have Ben Soro Umore uh, and the Irhani Dachas, which have death penalties, which Chazal say never happened and never will happen. That doesn't render the Torah's statement invalid. Um, uh, it's just uh, an eventuality. It, it, sorry, it's just a statement about like the fact that, you know, that this this could be an eventuality, okay? Um, so that's how the Ramam answers that question on the Egyptians. Uh, any questions on that before we go to Paro? It's slippery in the sense that, like, you want to go to the Ram, you want to be like, wait, so Ram, do you mean that if all the Egyptians have chosen had chosen to not enslave B'nai Israel, then they could have chosen to not do that? And I think the answer is yes, that they could have chosen to not enslave B'nai Israel. And the proof of that is what he's saying with the Torah, which is that he's saying, you just because you have a statement in the Torah that that people, the one who violates the Shabbos will be put to death, does not mean that anyone has to violate that um you know that law and in fact rabbi foreman on all torah has a shear and i've given a similar shear which is not recorded on how it could have been that egypt would not have enslaved b'nai israel and uh and our fate would have been different you know and it would have been much better rabbi Shneweis? yes then what would it happen in terms of the haftah of Abraham? right so mm, so i think what would have happened is um, and this is kind of another can of worms, but um, we have a rule that the Ramam says, let me open it up here. Might as well quote from the Ramam when we can. In Hilchus Yisodei Torah, chapter six. No, not chapter six. Why did I say chapter six? It's either seven or eight. Um... Just one second. I'll cheat. Yeah, uh, it's in chapter 10, <laughs> 10 4 in Yesodei Torah. 
Divri Hapurano Sheha Navi Omer, um, uh, statements of like retribution that a, a prophet says, Kigon Shiomar Ploni Yamus Oshana Plonis Shana Raev O Milhama Vakyota Bedora Melu. Uh, for example, if a prophet said so-and-so will die or such and such a year will be a year of famine or there will be war or other things like that. Imlo amdu devarav, if those do not come true, that is not considered to be a, uh, uh, an undermining of his prophecy. We don't say that the prophet made a prediction that didn't come true. Hashem is slow to anger and abundant in kindness. And and uh, changes his mind regarding the evil. The Efsharsh Asu Teshuva Vinislak Lahem Kaanche Ninve Oshitala Lahem Kechizkia. It's possible that the matter was forgiven for them. They did Teshuva and they were forgiven, um, uh, like the people of Ninve, uh, or it was uh, delayed, like Chizkiahu. About Im Hivtiach Al Hatova Amrshi Yekachakach. But if God uh, promises through Navi that some and such will happen, and that the thing doesn't happen, it is known that he is a false prophet. Because anything that God decrees that is good, even on condition, does not go back, uh, you know, does not go back empty-handed. And that's why you can only test a Navi using good things. So my answer to, to Esti's question is, if Hashem said that your descendants will be enslaved by the uh, the Mitzrayim. And if Bnei Israel had done Teshuva, or if the Mitzrayim had done Teshuva, and it didn't happen, all the better. You know, we don't, we don't have any guarantees for bad, only guarantees for good. Um, so I think that that would have been the case. So does that mean that Klai Yisrael were enslaved because of their own own flaws and not because of a, a, you know, a divine plan for them? That's a Mach Lokas Rishonim. Um, so for example, Sforno is of the opinion that, uh, and I think the Ramban, if I'm not mistaken, that Bnei Israel brought it onto themselves, uh, and that's why they were enslaved. And if had they kept up the lifestyle of the Avos and the values of the Avos, then the Mitzrayim would never have enslaved them. Um, and um, others hold that the slavery process was necessary and that Bnei Israel would have gone through this process in some way anyway for those purposes, uh, regardless of whether they were, sin whether they were sinful. However, Let's say, according to that shita, the Egyptians all decided to do tshuva. So we have a statement, God has many uh, agents at his disposal. God would have achieved those purposes in some other way, uh, if not through the enslavement by the Egyptians. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so now we get to Paro. Okay. Um, still, still in all, God's statement that he had hardened Paro's heart and the fact that he later punished him and had him destroyed needs to be addressed here. We will actually deduce an important principle from it. Therefore, reflect upon what I have to say about this as opposed to what others have said and decide for yourself who is right, okay? Um, you should always do this when you're learning, by the way, even when the Ram doesn't say it, right? Uh, reflect on what, but the Ram here is acknowledging that there are other, uh, uh, other positions, okay? And in fact, we're gonna see an opposite position in a second, or not in a second, in a little while. He says, now, if the only sin Paro and his servants had committed was not setting Israel free, that would certainly be problematic, since God himself prevented them from freeing the Israelites. As it is written, for I, God, hardened his heart and the heart of his servants. After all, how could God have asked Paro to set them free if he were forced not to? And how could God have punished him afterwards for not setting them free, then destroy him and his servants? That certainly would not have been just, and it would have been it would have contradiction everything we uh, it would have contradicted everything we said. But that is not the case. So, in other words, for God to give a commandment, you know, put on tefillin, and then for Him to prevent you from putting on tefillin, that would just be straight up injustice. So, if God said, "Set them free," and then He prevented Paro from setting them free, that would be complete injustice. But that's not what happened. Back to the Ramam. In point of fact, Paro and his servants willfully rebelled rather than acquiescing to force or compulsion in an earlier instance, when they oppressed the foreigners in their midst without any justification whatsoever. For as it explicitly stated, Paro said to his people, behold, the children of Israel are more numerous than, and mighty than we. Come, let us deal cunningly with them. They did, what, they did that freely and with evil intent without any compulsion. So God punished them for that by preventing them from repenting and by thus allowing them to incur the sentence his judgment deemed was due them. Pause there for one second. Ramam is saying like this, if God said, let my people go, 
which by the way, the Torah never actually says the phrase, let my people go. That's just in the movies. But, you know, um, it says, let my people go that they may serve me. Okay, but whatever. Uh, we'll use the, the idiom. Let my people go. And then if the only if he then prevented them from letting the people go, that would be unjust. But what the Egyptians did is they oppressed the Jews and God punished them for the oppression by withholding their free will, which the Ramu is now going to go into. It says like this. So God punished them for that by preventing them from repenting and by thus allowing them to incur the sentence his judgment deemed was due them. Hence, it was not their setting Israel free previously, which prevented the Egyptians from repenting. In fact, God already made this clear to power by letting him know that if he, Hashem, had only wanted to have the Jewish nation set free, he would have destroyed Paro and his servants and set the Israelites free then and there on his own. But besides wanting the Israelites free, God wanted to punish the Egyptians for their earlier wickedness in having oppressed them in the first place, as he told Abraham when he said, I will also judge the nation that they will serve. Since it would have been impossible to punish the Egyptians if they had repented, God withheld repentance from them and they kept the Israelites in bondage. Only then did God say, I will now stretch forth my hand, for indeed, it was for this that I elevated you. Okay, so that's the Ramam's answer here, is that God prevented the Egyptians from letting people go so that they could get punished for doing an act of oppression that they did out of their own free will. Okay, so that's step two. Why was this, the like, his response? I guess we can't know, oh. like, definitively, okay. but... So that's what the Ram addresses now, okay? I think he says this explicitly. Now, do not take us to task for saying that God sometimes... Oh, sorry. I'm, so, I'm sorry, before you proceed. But yeah. Doesn't that bring on like another slew of punishments? It's like punishment one, punishment two. Mm. When you say punishments, do you mean the Makos? Yeah. Right, so he's saying that that is the punishment for the affliction that, Cla that, that the Egyptians did to Claudius Israel. Oh, that's the punishment. And so he with, withheld, uh, okay, okay. Yeah, so yeah, let, let me clarify that, right? So so there were three things. There was the Egyptian sin, the Egyptian's punishment, and then the by me, the means by which God inflicted that punishment or allowed that punishment to happen, okay? So the, the sin of the Egyptians was afflicting the Jews. The punishment was the Makos, or at least the first nine Makos, okay? Um, well, I, I, well, we'll see whether it's the first nine or all of them. And then- in order to ensure that they got that punishment, God took away their free will and prevented them from letting the Jews go. And okay. if they would have done, if they would have done shuva, then they would have gotten a different punishment. Then they would not have gotten. They either would have not gotten. I guess it depends on how good their shuva was, or how, um, or what level of punishment they had in what level of sin that they had done to warrant punishment in other words sometimes when you do chuva you get the entire punishment removed sometimes you get a mitigated form of the punishment you know so I, i'm not sure exactly what it would uh, how it would have turned out yeah okay but there's there's a night as there's there's a i guess a principle that i, I yeah i guess i'm just I, st I think i'm still not getting it the there idea is. that that God can assure that a person will get a specific punishment is, is a, there's a principle like that? Yeah, I think that's what the Ram is going to say now. Okay, well, let's see. If he doesn't answer the question, then the Ram does answer it in the Mishnah Torah, so we can read there. Now, do not take us to task for saying that God sometimes punishes a person by preventing him from repenting and not allowing him the choice to repent. For God knows our sins and meets out our punishments wisely and justly. Sometimes he punishes a person only in this world and other times only in the world to come and sometimes in both worlds together. Even this, wor this, this worldly punishments for sins vary. Sometimes we are punished physically, at other times financially, and at times both ways at once. He might, for example, punish someone by limiting movements he usually has control over, for example, by paralyzing a person's hand as he did to Yeravim ben Nevat, or he might blind his eye as he did to the men of Sodom who gathered outside Lot's door. In the same way, God might withhold a person's will to repent so that he is never inspired to do so at all, and thus, and he thus perishes a sinner. I've never seen the word perish to be in Hefeel before. Okay, um, so he's saying that there are a variety of punishments, and the deprivation of free will is one of those punishments. Now, the ambiguity in the Ramam here, which I don't fully understand, is it's unclear what exactly was the punishment for the Egyptians. Was it the Makos? And re removing free will was merely a means of assuring, ensuring that they didn't do tshuva so they could get that punishment? Or is it what the Ramam sounds like he's saying now, which is that the removal of free will per se is part of the punishment? Okay, I think there is an ambiguity in the Ramam. 
Okay, but let's see if we can resolve the ambiguity here. Um, but we are not obligated to fathom his wisdom. This is what Nava just said. We are not obligated to fathom his wisdom and understand why he would punish one person one way rather than another any more than we are expected to know why a certain species was was configured one way rather than another. Uh, the general principle is that all of God's ways are just and that he punishes the sinner according to his sins and rewards the pious according to his piety. So it's interesting that the Ramam here invokes the unknowability of God's ways. He's saying that, we know that God is just, and we know that he gives different punishments, but we can't understand why he gives this particular punishment for this particular um, Avera, you know, uh, that's beyond our knowledge. Uh, and that would be like asking, why did God create, you know, cows with udders or elephants with trunks? You know, um, that's just not a question that's in with, uh, within our purview to answer. So not the most satisfying answer, okay? Um, but uh, going back to... Um, so just to reframe Esti's question in terms of this, we can know why God gives certain punishments by looking at the punishment. For example, like, like let's say just as a, a, an example of this, you know, um, you know, you speak Lashon Hara and you get Saras, right? So you can see certain reasoning in that of like Lashon Hara is a chet bin Adon Lachavero that has to do with how you relate to your fellow person and how you view your own role in society. So you get an affliction that casts you out of society. There's a certain media connected media in that. That we can see a, re a rhyme and reason in. So can we see a rhyme and reason? Oh, and we can also see if God needed to prevent someone from using their free will in order to get them another punishment that had a rhyme and reason, we could understand that. So let's say, for example, that you know part of the Egyptian oppression of the Jews had to do with I don't know if this is uh, explicitly said, let's say it had to do with their view, uh, their Avodah right? And we know that there are explanations where all the Makos were like systematically refuting the Egyptian uh, views of Avodah and establishing Hashem as the uh, the one true God of all the universe. So let's say in order to give a Medic negative mean of punishment for the Egyptians, God had to design this whole Makos curriculum to show, oh, you think that you are, you know, favored by the God of the Nile? I'll show you that there is no God of the Nile uh, by turning it to blood and Hashem is the only God. And therefore that undercuts your whole like reason why you view yourself as superior and you're enslaving the Jews. You know, let's say in order to do that, God had to deprive someone of free will that we would understand also. But the question, as you correct me if I'm wrong, if this is what you're asking, like how does it make sense to derive, deprive a person of free will as a punishment in its own right? Yes, if it entails another set of punishments that they're going to get if it entails right well okay right if it entails another because then that would just seem to be like heaping punishments onto a person not through their own actions like yeah yeah like yeah. I, I i mean i don't know why it would be this way but maybe the punishment is that you can't do chuva then oh i guess then you get the consequence of your yeah like yeah i guess it kind of is like a moving target like which one is the right. punishment if the punishment right is right, the, right. Yeah, that's the difficulty here. Is which one is the punishment and which one is the means to the punishment? Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, just out of curiosity and out of seeking knowledge, uh, <laughs> I just want to see how he phrases it in the Mishnah Torah because he raises the same question, okay? Um, and uh, he says like this. Um, uh, let me just think where to start. Yeah, you know what? I feel like I want to read this. You know, I, I apologize. Did anyone, and, and please answer honestly here, did anyone have like a burning Q&A question that they felt like they had to ask this week? Because if not, then I, I don't mind using the rest of this on this uh, <laughs> topic. Yeah, this is, uh, I should have known that this topic would like have a lot of uh, ins and outs here. Okay, fine. So I, 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 I owe you a Q&A, okay, um, at some point. Okay, so he says like this. Um, the Ramam says, uh, Psukim harbe yesh batora. This is in Hilchos Tshuva Perak Vav. Psukim harbe batora yesh uvedivri nevim shenirin sosrin ikarze. So the fifth perak was about free will, and the Rambam says there are many uh, psukim in the Torah and the nevim that seem like they contradict this ikar. V'nichshalin bo rov ne adam rov adam. Many people get this wrong. Viali al datam mehen shakadosh baruch hu gozer al adam lasos tova or ra. They think that God will decree upon a person to do good or evil. And that man's heart is not given over to him to go to whichever direction he wants. I'm going to tell you a big principle that you can use to answer all the psukim. At a time when a person or people of a community 
uh, society sin. And a person, a sinner, does a sin which he did with his own mind and his own will, like we made known. It is fit, he's fit to be punished. God knows how to punish him. Certain punishments are such that they get punished in this world. In his body, in his property, or in his young children. Um, uh, young children who, are, who don't have any knowledge and who are not in the realm of mitzvos are like a person's possessions. Uh, Kasuv, it's written, Ish becheto yumas, ach yase ish. It says, a man, each man in his sin will die. You have to be a man, meaning you have to reach the level of mitzvos. Okay, that's a whole other thing we're not going to get into now. Other sins are such that the, the law dictates that they are punished in Olam Haba. In over alav, shum nezek ba'olam zeh, and they don't get any harm in this world. And certain things they're punished for in this world and the next world. But made when are we talking about That's if they didn't do tshuva. Alva if they did tshuva, hatshuva then tshuva is like a shield uh, against punishments. And just like I don't know if I read that correctly. Just like a person sins out of his will and mind, so too he does tshuva with his will and his mind. Okay, so that's the general principle. But now he gets into paro, sorry, into into depriving free will. It's possible that a person will do a huge sin or many huge sins, or sorry, or many sins. To the point where where the the sentence is meted out before the true judge. That the punishment meted out for the sin that this guy did with his own will and his own mind, Shimon in me meno hatashuva, that he, that teshuva is withheld from him. The aim in nichen lo rashus lashuv mi risho. And he does not have the permission to do teshuva from his wickedness. Kedeshi yamus viyovad bachatayim shasa, so that he dies and perishes uh, based on the sins that he did. Who shall Kadash Barahu Omer Aide Yishaya, Yishayahu? This is what a Kaddish Baruch Hu said through Yeshayahu, Hashmin Leva Am Hazev Vishav Varafalo. Uh the heart of this people has become fat, and he has done to shoe it has okay. I think if you read the Pasuk, it actually works out better. Hold on. Uh Hashmin Leva Am Hazev Oznav Hachbe the Inav Hacha uh Hasha. Um, uh, he has made fat the heart of this people and he has made their ears heavy and he has covered up their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and do teshuva and be healed. So Ram is learning the puzzle, the, the others who disagree. Ram is learning that God basically like made Klai so that they didn't do teshuva uh, because their sins were so bad. And also says in Devarah um, uh, They will mock the agents of God and de degrade his words and make fun of his Nevi'im until the wrath of God comes up in his people to the point where there's no healing. They sinned by their will, the Hirbu Lifshoa, and they've done excessive punishment. Sorry, they've done excessive um, uh, rebellion. So the point where they've lost the ability to do the ability to do tshuva, which is the healing. And that is paro, he's saying. I have strengthened the heart of paro. Since he sinned on his own first, the Herali Israel, Hagarim Baarzo. And he afflicted the Jews uh, that are in his land. Shinemar, as it says, Hava Nishakmalo, come let us outsmart it. Nasan Hadin Lim no Mimino Hatshuva. God said the din to prevent Tushuva from him. Ajni from Mimeno to the point where where he would uh, be punished. That's why God strengthened his heart. Okay. So so I think the way he's gonna answer Esti's question is like this: is and and still there's an ambiguity here, but it sounds like he's saying like this that. The, the, the real paro sinned so much 
and warns it so much punishment that that unlike the ordinary sinner who will get punished, but then can reduce or eliminate the punishment through tshuva, God is withholding Paro's free will so that he gets all the consequences of his actions and is destroyed. So, so it is, in other words, the other makos are part of the punishment. It's not that, like Essie's question, I think was part, was, was predicated on the fact that like, isn't Paro continuing to withhold to, to, to you know hold back the Jews and getting more punishment. I think the Ram saying no 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 like all the Makos are are themselves part of the punishment which is gonna which the Paro needs and he needs to be prevented from doing free will to get those punishments. Um I just have a question. Uh, yeah. if somebody chooses like I don't know um, if somebody makes really bad decisions or they build a habit um, that you know is really bad uh, or you know I feel like an addiction would be a good example in that right. we make choices at the beginning and then right. it's already not only based on them. So where do they fit? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, hold on just, I'm going to hold on to that question for just one second because uh, Esty, did you have uh, a question on my answer to your question? Okay. I think it is, does this, is this, I think that my question was really coming from a uh, presumption that okay. kind of a person has a right to do tshuva. So right. what, uh, really, really good, what you're saying good. is yeah. you're separating between those two things. Nobody has a right to do that. That's just right. something that HaKadosh Baruch Hu built in and he's free to remove it if the situation warrants it. Right. And then you just get the consequences like you should have to begin with if Hashem weren't giving you the opportunity to do tshuva. Correct. That's a really good way to say it is. I think, yeah, there's a certain presumption we have that I have the right to have free will and a right to do tshuva. And at some point a person loses that privilege, you know, and uh, it really is like, and, and this is what, what I thought you were asking earlier. So I'm just going to go and ask this as my own question. Now, what kind of a punishment is it to lose your right to do tshuva? You know, so it, there is a reality. I'm going to kind of segue into an answer to, to, the, to the, the other question that was just asked. There, there is a reality of that in the path that a person chooses to go, he is assisted. Or someone who comes to be purified is assisted. Uh, and someone who comes to become tame is assisted. You know, that that's the way, excuse me, that's the way God designed the world, it, which is that, that, and that's what it means to be the only creature on earth who has free will, that the path that we choose, it's not like we make choice A and they get consequence B and then that's end of story. It's that we are really choosing path A, which like leads down a whole alphabet, which like leads to other decisions and other, other consequences, you know, and we shape ourselves through the decisions that we make. So in a case like Paro, you know, you, he's choosing a path that really is the path of a non-human, of like an animal, or even worse than an animal, because animals can't be cruel through through Bechira. And what's the result? Is it really is me to connect me to you lose your ability to be a human if you've chosen to live as a non-human, you know? And and with, with free will is, is withheld from you there. Um, so that's in the case of Paro. And by the way, I'm just going to throw Hitler into the mix because you know people used to ask, you know, we, we say that uh, that. Um, you know, the Ram says at the end of Hilgos Tshuva Perik Dalid, Tshuva Perik Dalid is that there are 24 things that withhold Tshuva, okay? And he goes through the, the, the categories, and at the end he says, Kol elu hadvarim v'kiyotzeben afopisha ma'akmi nasa Tshuva, enan moni nasa Tshuva. Even though these things hold back Tshuva, they don't prevent Tshuva. Ella im asa adam Tshuva mehen, rather if a person did Tshuva from them, harize bal Tshuva. Then, uh, then he is a Baal Teshuvah of Yishlochei Olam Haba, and he has a portion in Olam Haba. So people have asked me before, you know, does that mean that Hitler could have done Tshuva and God would have accepted it? So I used to answer that the answer is yes, that Hitler could have done Tshuva and, and God would have accepted it. But what I'm realizing now, based on the Ramam in Perak Vav that we were just doing, is I think that there does come a point where you lose your right to do teshuva. And, and it's possible that Hitler is one of these cases where he got so far along his path of Rishus that he lost the ability to do teshuva in the end and perished as a result of his, uh, of his sins, you know? Um, 
Now, what about cases that are not as bad as Hitler and Tshuva? Let's say like the question that was asked about addiction, you know, that a person starts off making a choice to, um, to let's say like uh, experiment with a certain drug and uh, they can become addicted and get to a point where, where free choice is, uh, is, you know, is difficult, if not impossible, right? So here's what I'd say. I mean, and, and, and by the way, also like, you know, that there are different, you know, people are predisposed to addiction in different ways. Like, uh, you know, children of an alcoholic are predisposed both genetically and like by, by nature and nurture to alcoholism. Like that's a reality, you know, um, or if you are in a society where drug use is rampant uh, or, or, or a group of people who drug use is rampant, then you're going to be more predisposed to like, you know, um, uh, uh, engaging in those behaviors and, and it's going to be harder for you to pull out of it. So the reality is that, yeah, that's the case is that, that um, a person through doing this could lose their, free will. And for some people, it might take a lot of decisions before they get to that point. And another person, they could be predisposed where they could lose their free will pretty easily. At the same time, though, and I, I'm saying this based on, you know, knowing a number of, of drug addicts, and my dad was in, uh, uh, was a, a psychiatrist who specialized in drug addiction, that like, you know, and there are many, many, many stories about this, is that uh, I don't I, I think that there are many cases where drug addicts think that they have lost their free will and they actually haven't, uh, that you have cases where a person is, a, you know, is addicted to drugs for decades and then achieves decades of sobriety, you know, and is so, so sober for the rest of their life. So, so I, I would be hesitant to say that any particular drug addict actually loses their free will, you know, um, that, that it's, it, I'm not minimizing the struggle of addiction, but like, you know, the, the, the talk to any, any person who specializes in, in, in drug addiction, whether it's a 12 step program or some other program, you know, uh, there's many, many different philosophies of, 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 of rehab that like you could get pretty, pretty far along and there still are opportunities to choose. Uh, whereas it sounds like Paro got way further than that. You know, like there's no even opportunity to choose. So I, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, it does. So I just kind of, a, uh, another question I have is, um, is it, so when they're still, you know, I mean, this also gets into mental illness, but are people responsible for what they do when they are under the influence of uh, their addiction or? That's a good question. Right. So the general, so I think you can look at the, okay, let's divide this into two categories. I'm going to give you the short answer because uh, you're right. This is a whole nother topic, but um, there is a case of ones in Torah, right? Ones means things that you can't control, actions that you can't control. And if you look in, in, uh, in halacha, you know, if someone has a mental, you know, there's a category called a shota, which is someone who's mentally ill, and you could be a shota in total, you know, like, or you could be a shota in, in particular behaviors. And the general rule in halakha is wherever a shota is in the level of ones, we don't hold them responsible for their actions halakhically. And there are halakhic ramifications here, you know, like if a shota, you know, um, makes a purchase or, or, you know, does kiddushin to a woman, uh, we if they are, if that's in the sphere of an area where they are, let's say like a person, let's use another example. Let's say a person's married and they are manic depressive, you know, bipolar or whatever, and they divorce their wife in a state of depression. We don't, it, that doesn't count. Like we don't treat that as a valid action, you know? So, so the general rule in halakha is that if you can't control your actions, halakhically you're not responsible. Now in halakha, we, then the, the, the posik or the base team has to make that assessment. And this is one of these areas where you assess it based on halakhic knowledge and up-to-date medical knowledge. In the realm of beyond halakha, of God judging the person, only God knows who is actually in a case where they can't control their actions or not. You know, So there are cases like that. Like we say, if a person is raised non-religious, then you know we treat them as ones. Uh, they're a tinuk shanishba. We treat them as though they can't control their actions. Now, that doesn't mean that they absolutely can't control their actions, but like only God can evaluate, you know, has this person gotten to the point where they've been ex exposed to Judaism in a way where like they're now in the realm of Bechira, of a free choice or, or not, you know, and same thing with mental illness. Um, only God knows ultimately. Okay. Back to Paro. Okay. Cause I do want to do this for no's opinion. So let's just finish rereading the Ram or reading the Ram in the Shimona Prakim. Uh, and then we'll uh, go to uh, the opposite answer. Okay. He says, 
Should you then ask, then why did he, Hashem, keep asking Paro to set Israel free when he was being prevented from doing so? And why did the plagues continue to strike Paro while being obstinate when, as we said, his obstinacy was all part of God's punishment? God should not have needlessly asked him to stop doing something that he could not do. Okay, so that kind of touches on on that original question of like, you know, like it's again, it's like the, uh, you know, the stereotypical movie sibling thing where the older sibling grabs the hand of the younger sibling and goes, why do you keep hitting yourself? Why do you keep hitting yourself? You know, like that's kind of the thing with the, with God and Paro. Okay, but that too was rooted in God's wisdom. It was meant to teach Paro that God can withhold a person's free will if he wants to. Okay, God therefore said to him, I am asking you to set them free and you will be saved if you do, but I know you won't, so you will be destroyed. And Paro wanted to comply with God's order to set the Israelites free in order to have it appear that he had overturned the prophet's declaration that he could not, but he was unable, unable to. Thus, it served as a great and public wonder for all mankind, as it is written, quote, it was for this that I have elevated you to have you proclaim my name, Hashem's name throughout the earth, to affirm that God can punish a person by withholding his free will a particular way, and that the person would be aware of this and be unable to reassert his free will. So this is an additional element to what the Ramam has said so far, which is, yeah, sometimes God will take away a person's free will as a punishment, or so that they suffer other punishments that they that they incurred earlier. Um, or it could be what I said, which is that they get to a level where they lose their right to have free will as a punishment itself. Like you act like an animal, you're going to become an animal, you know? Um, but then in this case, he's saying Paro wanted to do something extra bad, which was to demonstrate that he can overrule the creator of the universe by, by, by breaking out of this thing of, uh, of, of having his free will, uh, you know, inhibited. So God says, oh, you think you can do that? You can't. So he's going to make a mockery of Paro by, by putting him in a situation where everyone's going to look at Paro and be like, idiot, like, why do you keep going, you know? And it's going to demonstrate that God can control even human free will. And even and remember, this is not just any human being. This is a guy who held himself up to be a God. God can, you Paro think that you're God and you can overrule the God of the Hebrews? No, I am God, the creator of the universe. I can overrule you. So it was a public demonstration for Kiddush Hashem purposes. And that's an additional reason why God took away Paro's free will. So that's the end of what I want to do in the, in the Rambam. Uh, any questions on that before we go to the Sforno? Yeah. So I want to yes. clarify with when a person does something wrong, the punishment yeah. that they receive is going to, in one way or another, parallel their wrongdoing. I want to make well, sure I okay. understand that. So, so that is, you're asking about like the Mita Kanega Mita thing? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a, a broader question that I'm prepared to answer because Mita connected Mita is a, a style of divine punishment, okay, uh, that many punishments of Hashgacha and many punishments in the laws of nature are Mita connected Mita, which means that they point to the, the character or the nature of the sin. Are all punishments like that? No, because there is this whole category of punishment of Hester Panim, which arguably is the, the majority of the punishments that we suffer, where God simply removes his, his hashgacha, and then we're just subject to chance. And that's not going to end up being in the Mita Kanegad Mita way. You know? So the question of when you can assume that there is a Mita Kanegad Mita punishment and when you can't is a question that I don't know the answer to. All I know is that there are two styles of punishments. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So to sum it up, the Ramam is saying that Paro's, the hardening of Paro's heart was taking away his free will as both a means of giving him the punishment for enslaving and oppressing the Jews and as a punishment on its own and as a Kiddush Hashem demonstration. How, what percentage are all those things? I'm not exactly sure, but those are the three things, okay? Now Sforno, okay? Now here's the thing. Okay, I know I I'm not supposed to like play favorites, uh, and like reveal my prejudice. I like the Sforno's answer way better than the Rambam. Okay. So if you can argue, I'm telling you this because in case you, if you can argue to me in favor of the Rambam, then I'm open to arguments uh, because I've always been bothered by that Rambam, but here's the Sforno. Okay. And the Sforno says it in several places. Uh, I'm just going to read a couple. So in chapter seven, Puzzle Gimel, okay. Uh, on the Dibra Moscow, I will harden. 
Okay, and by the way, if this had been planned out as a shear, we would have gone through all the psukim, but you can do that on your own over Shabbos. Okay, I will harden Paro's heart. Since God wants the Rashaim to do Teshuva and does not want to kill them, Ka'amro, as he says, and we quote this Pasuk and similar Pasukim in Ni'ila a lot in from Yechezkel, Chai Ani Neumar Hashem, uh, as I live, says Hashem, Im Echpotz Mamos HaRasha, do I want the death of the Rasha? No, I just want the Russia to do Teshuva and live. Oh, hold on just one second. Pause the recording. I realize, embarrassingly, hold on. Okay, crisis averted. All right, anyway. So uh, God does not want people, to, does not want even Roshayim to die. He wants them to do Teshuva, okay? Amar, so therefore, he said, God will increase the wonders and signs why to make to get the mitrim to do teshuva by making known to them his greatness and his chesed in the miracles and wonders kamro as it says bavur zos bavur uh, god says for this reason i have preserved you in order to demonstrate to you my power so he's saying like this what was the purpose of all the makos and the miracles is to show the greatness of God, to get the midstream to say, oh, maybe these Egyptian gods are not real, and maybe these actions we've been doing, and you know, are, are not good. Maybe we should follow this uh, this this one true God. Okay. V'im haisa hakavana shi Yisrael yiru uvi yirau ka'amro laman shisi ososa ela bikirbo ulaman tasafir, and also with this was that Israel should see and fear, as it says, I in order for me to place my signs. In your midst, so that you will tell your son and your your, your children after you um, about the wonders that I did. So Israel also, you know, needed to see this demonstration of God's power. Okay, now here's where it gets to Paro. So it's all good so far. God wants Rashaim to do tshuva, and these miracles are to get them to do tshuva. Ve'in Suffolk, shilule hachvadas halev. Without a doubt, if it weren't for God hardening Paro's heart or literally making it heavy, haya Paro mishaleach es Yisrael b'li Suffolk. Paro would have definitely sent out Israel without a doubt. Lo al tzad teshuva v'hach na'ala kel yisbarach. Not out of teshuva and submission to God. She is nachem yos moreid and regretting, rebelling against God. Afo pi shihikir God levatuvo, even though he recognizes his greatness and goodness. Ela al tzad he yosu bilti yahu lispul od es tzaras amakos, but only because he can no longer tolerate the affliction of the makos. Kamoshi higido avadav ba'amro, as the his servant said to him, "Haterm teidak avda mitzrayim." Don't you know that Egypt is lost? V'zos lo haisa tshuva klal. That wouldn't have been tshuva at all. Aval im haya paro chavitz li kanela kel yisparach v'lashuv ilav b'tshuva shlema lo haya lo mizeh shumonea. If Paro had wanted to submit himself to God and to do tshuva with real tshuva, God would not have prevented him at all. V'hine hakel amar hakel. Therefore, God said yisparach v'ani akshe es paro. I will harden Paro's heart. She is amitz lisbol hamakos, so that Paro will be able to tolerate the makos, v'lo yishalach miyiras hamakos as Yisrael, so that he wouldn't refrain from sending Jews out because of fear of the makos. Laman shisi osos ela bikirbo, so that I can make his uh, signs in uh, in in its midst. Shemehem yakiru godli v'tuvi, so that they will recognize my greatness and my goodness. Yashuvim hamitzrim beezo teshuva amitis, and the Egyptians can do teshuva through any. Uh, 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 through some real tshuva. I'll summarize in a second. Laman Saper, and in order to proclaim Ata Yisrael, Haroah B'Tzarasim, so that the Jews will proclaim these wonders who saw the afflictions, but Ozne Bincha in the ears of their of their sons. Lahodia Shekol Ela Yifalkel Im Gever Lahashivo Elav. So that the Jews will see that God will do all of this with human beings to get them to do tshuva. V'zeh Kishi Yifash V'shu B'Maseim B'vo Aleim Eze Puranos. And that's if they investigate their actions when God brings uh, punishment upon them. Okay, so what's Sforno's answer? He's saying like this. I'll give you the analogy first. Okay, if I hold a gun to your head and say, you better apologize to your sibling, okay, uh, then that's bad parenting, all right? But also, it is not, if you apologize to your sibling, you're not going to be doing it out of real truth. You're gonna be doing it out of fear of the gun, okay? So if God brought these um, mock, so he got, Hashem is bringing the makos onto to Paro and, the Jews in order to demonstrate his greatness and his goodness 
to get them to do tshuva based on knowledge of God and on seeing his mastery over the universe. However, there was a chance that Paro, who's watching his whole kingdom be destroyed, would send out the Jews prematurely out of fear. And that's not free will, okay? Uh, and that would not be a real tshuva. That would be at minimal tshuva out of fear, but it might not even be tshuva at all. It would just be holding a gun to his head, okay? So what God did is he strengthened Paro's heart to make him not be intimidated by the gun to his head so that he could have free will, so that he ultimately would send out the Jews out of his own free will, okay? So it was balancing the scales. The scales were tipped in favor of losing free will. So Hashem is balancing them out by hardening his heart and giving him that extra fortitude so that he would have free will to send out his people, okay? And there is a, uh, I think there's, I've heard in the name of the Swarna, I just haven't seen it inside in a while. And I didn't know this was gonna be a shear, so I didn't look it up. Um, that the first five times that it talks about Paro's heart being hardened, it says Paro hardened his own heart. And this strategy was only necessary for the last Makos, where at the last Makos, God, or Paro would have, have sent the Jews out, and God had to harden his heart to make the demonstration complete so that when Paro did send them out, it was out of free will. Uh, let me just quote one more Sforno um, that I think says it a little bit clearer. This is an earlier Sforno in 7.4. Velo Yishma Alechem Paro, Paro will not listen to you. Lo Kodem Hahakshaa, not before the hardening of the heart. Gam Lo Achrechen, and not afterwards. Imra Oso Ribui Haoso Yisos Vamosim, when he sees the abundance of signs and wonders. Vlochen Eseb Hem Shvatim, therefore I will do judgments to them. Oh, here we go. Yeah, this is a separate part of the answer. Him Makas Bechoros Utfias Mitzrim Biyam. There are Sworn holds there are two punishments of the Egyptians. One is Makas Bechoros, and the other is the drowning of the Egyptians in the sea. Sheshnehem Bilvad Hayu Altsad Onish Lehem Mida Kenegem Mida. Only those two were punishments for the Mitri and Mida and Mida. Okay, not the other nine. About Shara Makos, how you Mosim Lahashivam Bichuva. The other nine were signs and wonders to get them to do Chuva. Kamro, as it says, Bezos Tedaki and Yashem, Laman Tedaki and Yashem Bekerfa Arat, Laman Tedaki and Yashem Arat, Laman Shisi Ososa Ela Bekirbo, Laman Tasapir. So if you look at all the statements of purpose by the other Makos, it never says out of punishment. It says, so that you'll know that I am. Uh, Hashem, so that you'll know that I'm Hashem in the midst of the earth, so that you'll know that, that the, the earth belongs to Hashem, so that I will place my signs in their midst in order that, they're, that they should tell it to their offspring, and they will know. Ata Yisrael v'amitrim, you Israel and the Egyptians. V'gam kishihid biyam kiven lasos b'open shanish arim b'mitzrayim yakiru v'yedu. And even when he drowned them in the sea, he did it in a way so that the others remaining in Egypt would recognize and know Hashem, as it says, Egypt will know that I am Hashem, and then they'll do tshuva. Sorry, one more sforno, and then, then I'll take questions and we'll summarize. Um, this is a further earlier sforno in 423, before Moshe even gets uh, sent, or when he's getting sent. It says, I Hashem will kill your firstborn, that's Paro's firstborn. That's according to uh, the divine judgment, which is Mida Kenegad Mida. Amro, as it says, in accordance with a man's way, it will befall him. Only Makos Bechoros was, out of all the Makos, was a punishment uh, for Paro. All the other Makos were to get him to do tshuva. Um, uh, because God doesn't want them to die. God does not close the doors of tshuva before anyone at all. If only they would be wise. Out of uh, to do tshuva to God out of love of His goodness and fear of His uh, uh, all of His greatness. That's the highest level of tshuva. Uh, which endows you with favor in the eyes of God and saves you. That will make your avonos reckoned as zechuyos. And if you want to know what that means, listen to my Sunday share I gave this Sunday. Or at least to get them to do tshuva out of fear of punishment. Um, and that's um, the, what do you call, um, uh, only the makas b'choros and the sinking in the sea uh, was a punishment. Okay, so to summarize, Sforno is the exact opposite of the Rambam. 
Okay. Ramam says that God will sometimes take away free will as a punishment. And that's what he did with Paro. Sforno says, and he says it here, God never closes the doors to Shuva, to Teshuvah at all. And everything he did to the Egyptians and even to Paro was to give him the free will to do the highest level of Teshuvah or to do at least the opportunity to do the highest level of Chuva. Okay. Um, and the reason why I like Sferno's answer better than the Rambam is because of the Psukim in Yechezkel that he quoted, which is God does not want Rashaim to die. He wants him to do tshuva. And the Rambam's paradigm of, of preventing a person from doing tshuva in order to annihilate them does not seem to me to fit into that paradigm, in, into that, that model. You know, I understand if, if according to the Rambam, naturally a person like gets to the point where they've lost their own free will. And maybe that's what the Ramam holds. And I also understand the idea of using Paro to demonstrate God's mastery. And by taking his free will, free will away, it shows that God has mastery even over human free will that I understand. Uh, but I don't understand like punishment to destroy the Russia. That does not seem to fit into me with, oh, and I also understand destroying the Russia because he's a menace to society. Like that's why we have the death penalty that, our death penalty serves two purposes. One is a deterrent. The other is there are certain people that if you allow them to live, then it endangers the other people in society in terms of the influence. So we have to remove them for the sake of the whole. But, but you know, like, like I have a theory that if it were just between God and Hitler, God would put Hitler in rehab. He would not kill Hitler. But why do Hitlers have to die? Because they cause too much damage to everyone else. God is Erich Apayim. God does not want Rashaim to die, but he kills Rashaim because he also cares about the system. You know, if it were up to God, if it were only on individual level, God would give you infinite time to do tshuva. So that's that's the Ramam and the Sforno, according to my understanding. Any questions on either of those? Yeah, is there, okay, I don't know, it might just be hard for me to digest this, but there, sure. according to the Rambam, there really does come a point in which a person can't come back from the decisions that they've made, like they're just okay. incapable so, of it. Here, here's a good question, this is a good question, because when the Rambam says there comes a point when you lose your Bechira, and he said in Hilchos Tshuva Perik Vav, um, that he will remove the person's bechira so that kadeshi yamus v'yovad b'chataim sh'asa, so that you will die and be destroyed from uh, in the sins that you've done. Okay, he makes it sound like a death sentence, right? That God will take away your free will, you won't be able to chuba, and you'll die in your sins. However, he quotes other and and, and Paro is uh, he quotes as an example, but then he quotes other examples where God did this on a temporary basis. Okay, like Sichon and the Kananim. And Klai Yisrael themselves, those are the three examples. He says, uh, I'll, I'll just read it. So Sichon, because of the sins that he did, uh, the iniquities he had, uh, God, uh, that made him liable to be, have Teshuva with hell. God hardened his spirit and strengthened his heart. Also the Canaanites. Based on their abominations, he withheld from them teshuva uh, until they waged war with Israel. Uh, that he strengthened their hearts so that they would proclaim war on Israel in order to, to annihilate them. So to Israel in the time of Eliyahu, who were so rebellious, Mana Omeosan Hamarvin Bitshuva, he withheld from them their ability to do Chuva, Shnemar, the Ata Hasibosa as Libam Ahoranis, and I have turned your heart backwards. Glomar, Manata Mehanat Chuva, he prevented them from Chuva. Nimtes Omer Shain Hakel Gozer Alparo Lahera Lisrael, Blo Al Sikhon Lachatoba Arto, Blo Hakanim Lahativ, Blo Al Yisrael Lavo de Vodazara. Turns out God did not decree on Paro to harm the Jews, nor on Sikhon to sin in his land nor the Kananim to do abominations, nor on Israel to serve Avodah Zarah, they all sinned on their own, and God made them all liable to do tshuva. Now, those examples sound like death sentences, okay, where he's saying, you can no longer do tshuva, sorry, end of story. End of story. Okay, but now check this out. This is a curveball, okay, and I think this is going to address a novice question in a way that makes us all more confused. 
That's why all the Nevi'im and Tzadikim in their Tfilos from Hashem asked to help them on the path of truth. Kamosha Amar David, like David says, Horeni Adashem Darkecha, instruct me Hashem in your way. Klomar, what does this mean? Klomar, this means to say, Al Yimna Uni Chata'ai Derecha Emes, Shemimena Eda Darkecha Vyichud Shemecha. Don't withhold, let my sins withhold from me the path of truth from which I can know your way and the oneness of your name. And same thing uh, David says, support me with a generous spirit. Let my spirit do its desire. And don't let my sins withhold teshuva from me. Let my freedom be in my hand. Until I return and understand and know the truth. And same thing with all these other psukim. So now he's saying like this. He, he quotes examples of, of Paro, Sihon, the Kananim, and Israel at their worst. And says, see, God withholds Tshuva from them, right? Until they're destroyed. And he says, and that's why David and all the Nevi'im said to God, don't withhold, let my sins withhold me uh, from doing Tshuva. So is this something that happens only to really, really bad people? If so, then why is David worried about it? You know? So... Right, you hear the question? Like, like, is this something that like only the worst of the worst get the tshuva with hell? Because up until that last halakha, it sounds like it's only for the worst of the worst. But now David is saying, Hashem, don't let this happen to me where I lose my ability to have free will and to do tshuva. But like, so that sounds like if it can happen to David, it can happen to anyone. But does not go with what we were saying before. I mean, as yeah, an answer, so? I also have an answer, yeah. but go ahead. Yeah, so that... It's kind of like, um, like if we're saying that these are two different systems and there's an interplay, I mean, there's, there's, there's Onish, but then there's also, you know, we don't have a right to do tshuva. Not that, right. that, that necessarily he, he's going to have Karsh Baruch who would take it away from Dava, but he's acknowledging the fact that this isn't something he has a right to do. Like he really does deserve the Onish that he, he is, you know, like the consequences of his actions are what they are. And we don't have a right, right. to to call upon um, Hashem's Rachamim and, and the ability to do tshuva. So he's acknowledging yeah. that, maybe. Okay, so certainly in David's tefillah, there is an acknowledgement of the fact that he has no right to have free will or to do tshuva. But to me, it doesn't read that way. The Ram, I mean, it doesn't read to me that that's the intent, that the Rama makes it sound like he was legitimately concerned that he would lose the ability to, to have free will and to do tshuva. Okay. You know? And and you could say that that maybe he's just so honest with himself that he realizes, like the Rama says in Hilchus Tshuva Perek Hamishti, um, that he says um, that Ella, um, can I say something he, while you're looking? Uh, uh, sorry, no. no. Okay, go. Okay. I, I'm not going to be able to, uh, to uh, think about it. Hold on. Um, he says, yeah, Ella Kol Adam Adam Roy Lihios Tzadi Kamosher Bina or Rasha Ki Ravam that. Maybe David realizes every person has the ability to be a tzaddik like Moshe Rabbeinu or a rasha like Yeravam. Funny you should mention Yeravam. Yeravam was such a tzaddik that God gave him a malchus and said, if you follow in David's ways, this malchus will last forever like David's. And you'll have two malchios in Klai Israel, malchus based David and malchus based Yeravam. And then Yeravam became one of the, the most evil kings ever. So maybe David is legitimately concerned that maybe I will become a rasha like you rub him and lose my ability to do tshuva. Okay. You could say that. Yeah. Esty, what were you going to say before I give my answer? Yeah. Just in terms of the, yeah. Okay. I mean, I was thinking in terms of the, the Hakash Baruch Hu, like, um, uh, like not Derek, uh, but Derek, uh, whatever, uh, I'm trying to remember what it was for the, like the person. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. And then the one, the one that if a person wants to choose a bad way, in other words, once he's done a, a, a fate, he's recognized that he put himself in the wrong direction and he wants to be right. going in the right direction. Okay. So I think that is the key to the answer, which is like this is I don't think you should view it as, I don't think we should view it as there are those of us with free will. And then there are the people who do the sins that are so bad that they lose their free will. Okay. I think it's quantitative. It's a spectrum that, that any sin that we do will, will, what does he say? Um, uh, will, 
Yimnauni chata'ai derech ha'emes. Anything we do, we'll, our sins will withhold from us the path of reality. Shemimena eda darka chav yichot shemecha. And block our, our ability to know God's way and his, his oneness. And will and any sin that we do will yigrumuli chata'ai limnoa ha'tshuva will withhold tshuva and and impinge upon our, our free will and our ability to avin the eda derech ha'emes and to know reality. And David Malik is saying, He's not saying, I'm worried that I'm going to do a sin and then be put in the same category as Paro to totally lose my free will. He's saying, any sin I do moves me further away from understanding Yichud Hashem and Derech Hashem, and, and it moves me out of the realm of free will. So it's a quantitative thing that we're on this sliding scale of how much free will do we have and how much do we, do, do we not have. And like any sin we do puts us on that road to losing our free will, losing our free will. And we could become someone who's like Paro who totally loses his free will. But any sin takes away our free will in some way. And any any zuhus and and tshuva makes us more capable of exercising our free will and like uh, and and doing tshuva, you know? So I think it is a quantitative thing. And so to answer Nava's question, yeah, you could get to a point of no return, but really the way to look at it is not like you've got 99 chances and then like if you get so bad, then like you lose your ability to do free will. It's no, we're always either sliding towards that direction and constantly losing our free will or gaining free will or losing free will in some areas and gaining free will in others. I think it's uh, it, that that's, that's human nature. Does that answer your question, Ava, or am I still missing a uh, part of the question? Yeah, I think I need to think about it, but- Okay, it, it's, it's a very hard area to think about because yeah, it's very yeah. multifaceted, yeah. Okay. Uh, if there aren't, if there are other questions, I'll, I'll take them. If not, we can stop here for today. I think that ended up being a good, uh, good two answers to pick. I, again, I'm sure there are more answers out there, but like in a sense, they really are opposite answers. And uh, and I, I think it's really cool, like to see a machlogus where both of them have like philosophical strong points. But like again, it just bothers me that in the Ramos paradigm, that like like in other words, okay, in the Ramos paradigm, let me just end with the thing what bothers me that. Those psukim in Yechezkel, God does not want the Russia to die. He just wants him to do tshuva. To me, if that were true, then God would never fully withhold tshuva from anybody. And that's why the Sforno explicitly says God will never fully withhold tshuva. And to me, the Ramam's position that you can lose free will, I understand what Ramam and SDR are saying that like, we, who, who says we have a right to do tshuva? But to me, like, my understanding of Derek Hashem is such that, yeah, God does not want a Russia to die. He, he almost wants to One question yeah, on yes. that? Yeah. Is the Rambam saying, like, had phenomenologically that they lost free will, like they got, like, or that it actually as a principle is revoked? I don't know. Because he, he in, in his language, he's, he says it's like, as a principle, it's revoked. But, um, uh, but he talks I have the about same that way. Like you, do. <laughs> you have the same what? I have the same difficulty you do, but if you think yeah. phenomenologically it was revoked because- Right, just then I have a far less problem, correct. Okay. Right, then it's really not God doing it. It's God structuring a world in which people can do it to themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I kind of like cling on to as the end of my answer. But I go back and forth in terms of whether I think that that's what the realm is actually saying or not. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Ian, but uh, now we got a lot to think about. Yeah. Thank you. Thank All you right. so Thanks much. for coming. All right, have a good Shabbos. Until next time. All right, bye. Good job.